While the Iron Master said, Get those fillers to the tunnel head, Have the gutter men ready in the casting house tonight. Get that water wheel turning, Blast those bellows till the fire burning, In the furnace is a blinding white. Well, Iron Master Hay swears that one of these days, He's gonna melt that Blairton Mountain down. He's gonna make Marmara an iron town. It's a twisted, rotted hell, a sea of mud from here to Belleville. Along that trail, some jokers call a road. And it's far too far to haul those iron bars when an ox cart is the only way to go. And Iron Master Hayes swears that one of these days he's gonna melt that Blairton Mountain down. He's gonna. What I think we can do is to learn to celebrate what happened in the past, to keep it alive. The story of Marmara uh, is kind of unique. It's a industrial site set up here. It's basically the first large one, the first large company town. Hayes, when he stands on the, on the cliff, looks at the rapids and says, this is wonderful. I can do something here. I can do something magic here and make something of this community. We have something special to tell about the history because uh, it's rather a special history. It's not the norm. The story of Marmara and the ironworks is a story of an industrial dream set in the wilds of a sparsely populated colony. From the start, it should have been written off as an impossible dream. In that it wasn't, lies its romance. Time and time again, the original Iron Master and his successors would beat their heads against bureaucracy, their bodies against the wilderness, and their fortunes against reality. By their success and more often their failures is written a story largely forgotten. In 1820, the interior of Upper Canada was a different world, a world of wilderness still in the hands of nature and of natives, a world of unknown promises and threats, and a world of opportunity for an adventurer like Charles Hayes, or so it seemed. Often in Ontario, little villages start collected around some rapids and they build a mill and the people who work at the mill need a tavern and if they're lucky they need a church and that's how the community grows. Marmor's a little different. It was really a planned community in a way. What happened was the powers that be in Upper Canada were worried about uh, invasion from America. Americans had 
kicked out the British only 30 or 40 years before. And they had had a war with us in 1812. So by the time Marmor was established in 1820, there was a big push to build a facility, an industrial facility, something beyond just the agriculture and the pioneer life to try to turn Upper Canada into a potential country to make it something that could produce its own necessities, the kettles, the sap buckets, the uh, pots, and even in the case of Marmor, the cannon that would be required to have Canada grow from a place where settlers went and tried to just subsist to a full-blown country. And that's what brought Charles Hayes to Marmor almost 200 years ago now. There was treasure waiting at Marmara. It lay covered by a silent forest. It lay twisted and trapped in the hard Precambrian rock, but it was there. There were clues where the ice and water had washed the rock face clean. The telltale signs of red were unmistakable. The treasure was iron. Here in Marmara began the first great industry in Ontario, the first real mining town. It was a mountain of iron-rich ore, the likes of which the pioneers had never seen. Surveyors and settlers were pushing up into the headwaters of the Trent and Crow Rivers. Government authorities were getting excited. If sketchy reports of the riches at Marmara were true, there was profit to be made. All across Upper Canada, villages were springing up around fast water. The high falls at Marmara was one of the best sites. The colonial administration saw the need to develop an iron industry in the Canadas. Supplies from Europe and America were costly, and as the War of 1812 had shown, of doubtful security. The forges at St. Maurice, below Montreal, faced exhausted ore supplies. Thus, Sir Peregrine Maitland, the Lieutenant Governor, canvassed interest in the business community in undertaking ironworks where ore and available water power could be found. Substantial military supply contracts were hinted at. Land grants to aid the entrepreneur could be arranged. In 1819, Charles Hayes, a man equally of vision and wealth, visited Maitland to discuss a possible ironworks venture. In most instances, emigration is a matter of necessity, not of choice. And this is more especially true of the emigration of persons of respectable connections or of any station or position in the world. Few educated persons accustomed to the refinements and luxuries of European society ever willingly relinquish those advantages and place themselves beyond the protective influence of the wise and revered institutions of their native land without the pressure of some urgent cause. Susanna Moody. We don't know a lot about him. He seems to have been a rather straight-laced fellow, definitely conservative, definitely adventurous, staking all this money thousands and thousands of British pounds, a fortune, on this enterprise up in the bush that any feasibility study would have said is completely impossible because even if you build kettles and stoves and all the things that settlers might need, aren't any settlers to sell it to. You've got to drag it back down to the St. Lawrence and then ship it abroad or try to ship it to new immigrants as they come. There wasn't much going on in Marmara before Charles Hayes arrived in 1820. There were some natives, that uh, native Canadians who uh, passed through. There doesn't seem to have been any native uh, permanent community there. And there were a few people, maybe they came up from the States, who just went into the bush and tried to start a life. And the uh, Upper Canada government was starting to reward their cronies, the ex-military, by issuing um, land patents to them and getting them 
on condition to go up into that area. Hayes, a linen merchant from Dublin, had made his fortune in the London business community. His remarkable organizing ability and drive were able to guide his entry into the opening field of iron making. In 1820, he emigrated to Canada, settling near the Trent River just a few miles west of Stirling. Undaunted by the wilderness, the nearest spot of civilization at Kingston was a hundred miles away. Hayes carved a road through to Marmara. Even the natives of the area for whom the Crow River is named seem to have treated it as a place to pass through. The Crow were a tribe of Ojibwe and established more permanent residences at Alderville, Hiawatha, and Roseneath. Millions of acres were acquired from the starving native tribes with King George III's money. Much of the promises and money would never be paid, with some treaty rights still being held back today. Any trouble Hayes would run into would not come from the native people, but the Europeans who came to the area. It's also reflected in what Hayes wrote. He wrote to Major Hillier, who was uh, the Lieutenant Governor's uh, secretary, he wrote, after being up in Marmor for a while, he said, could you by any possibility send me a map of Rawdon? That was the township he had just traveled through. I have a road some 16 miles long through the woods without a single house, and I am very desirous to have a few settlers upon it, which I could instantly obtain if I knew what lots were vacant. So he was doing all this work without even a good map. He would later bemoan, and when they did send him a map of Rawdon and some more information, he would bemoan and say, there are some abominable bad characters in Rawdon, which was his conclusion of those who were in his neighborhood. I had heard and read much of savages and have seen during my long residence in the bush somewhat of uncivilized life but the Indian is one of nature's gentlemen. He never says or does a rude or vulgar thing. The vicious, uneducated barbarians who form the surplus of overpopulous European countries are far behind the native man in delicacy of feeling or natural courtesy. Susanna Moody. At the beginning, a trip to and from Hayes' Kingston Depot would take three days and yet, it was over this rough brush road, everything to start an industry and village had to be and was hauled. It was not just a question of getting to the village, for at Marmara, large quantities of one of the industry's heaviest products was to be made at a place miles from where it could be of any possible use. But when Charles Hayes set off, well, first of all, he had to come up to St. Lawrence, and he came up, uh, in 1820 to Montreal, where he talked about his financing. He headed up the river by bateau, which would be a flat bottom boat pushed through the Lachine Rapids and so on, up to Prescott, where he would take the uh, steamboat. He called it a steamboat, it wasn't a ship, because it didn't go on the ocean. And it was just starting to be possible to go from Prescott to Kingston by steamboat. And he was on it, he arrived in what he described as perfect comfort in the beginning of November in 1820. That was the end of his perfect comfort. He had to get up to Marmara from Kingston, and to do so, he trekked his way up to Stirling, where there was a bit of a trail. From Stirling North, very little, if anything, to amount to a trail. Our progress was but slow on account of the roughness of the road, which is beset with innumerable obstacles in the shape of loose blocks of granite and limestone, with which the lands on the bank of the river and lakes abound, to say nothing of fallen trees, big roots, mud holes and corduroy bridges, over which you go jolt, 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 till every bone in your body feels as if it were going to be dislocated. An experienced bush traveller avoids many hard thumps by rising up or clinging onto the side of his rough vehicle. Catherine Parr Trail. The neighbourhood in which I propose my ironworks to be erected is thinly inhabited, must remain so. 
so long as water communication is wanted. Of the inhabitants such as they are, I deeply regret to say are deeply involved in Gaulism with all of its poverty, drunkenness and irreligion. I would also propose the establishment that an order should be imposed to refrain from granting any licenses for the sale of spiritous liquors within three or four miles of the village which will adjoin the works. Charles Hayes Hayes began the simultaneous construction of a mine, mill and smelter operation, plus the erection of homes and community buildings to house the workforce. One of the pits was less than 200 feet from the banks of the Crow River, and another mountain rose nearby. This one of marble, which gave the village of Marmara its name. Quickly exhausting the available ore at Marmara, he opened up mining operations nearby at Blairton, securing grants to the land in return for surveying the area. In early Upper Canada, everything involved either physical power where people or horses or oxen would work or some other sort of power. And the only other sort of power was natural power. And that was from waterfalls. That's why these mills were required. And the other thing was the transmission of power. From a mill site, you can't really transmit power very well unless you have an electrical line. They didn't have electric lines. So we're talking about transmitting powers by belts. And that doesn't go very far if you, by belt and gear, transmit power to a sawmill or a saw blade or uh, a shingle mill or something like this, or a blast furnace, you can only do it a certain distance. So finding in Marma the confluence of iron ore, water power, limestone, which would be used for flux when you run the furnaces, and uh, enormous amounts of wood available to reduce to charcoal to go in the furnace, that was kind of a unique coincidence that all these things were in the same area. And the Upper Canada government wanted to develop as some kind of a blast furnace, the biggest industry that Ontario would have at the time. They wanted to develop it back from the border of the St. Lawrence. And a lot of the Americans just presumed that it was natural they would expand northward into Canada. In order to defend against that, uh, the Upper Canada government and the British Foreign uh, Colonial Office realized we've got to get, first of all, people into Upper Canada, and secondly, industry and business. We've got to make it more self-sustaining. And that was the plan behind encouraging Charles Hayes to invest and lose his fortune up in the bush in Marmara. It was as if nature had designed a patch of this earth ready-made for the Ironmaster. The ore was set at Blairton, the water power five miles away at Marmara. They were joined by a calm waterway, ideal for navigation. The limestone ledges overshadowed the river below and stood as a natural loading ramp to the top of the furnaces Hayes would build. All along the shores and back up the Crow River system, timber awaited the lumbermen and its strip to be reduced to charcoal for the furnaces. It was an outpost. It had people working. There was an actual job other than farming. In Upper Canada, that was unusual. Most people would disappear into the bush. They'd carve out their little acreage, and you wouldn't hear much from them. In the, from then on, their family would stay there, and eventually the country around them would develop. In Marmara, there was a community. There was a company store. There was a church. There was a school. And uh, there, was, uh, there were workers' houses developed for the purpose of giving housing to those workers that came in. They were dependent on the company. I suppose like most company towns, Hayes managed to recuperate a lot of their wages <laughs> by running the store and selling the products to build their homes and so on. The mountain of ore would be discovered to be two lenses of sulfur-free ore and over a half a century, tons would be mined. Charles Hayes' barges would navigate the Crow with ease. His furnaces would campaign successfully in continuous blasts, which would last up to six months. 
the river would drive the water wheels, and the water wheels would pump the bellows, and out of the base of the great furnaces would pour the molten ore to be transformed into ballasts, pots, stoves, and even cannons. William Lyon Mackenzie later referred to it as kind of incomprehensible that he did all this. William Lyon Mackenzie was uh, one of his fans, not of his politics, he hated his politics, but he was a fan of his industry and what he had done in Upper Canada. And what he had done involved bringing uh, lining for those furnaces in the form of fire bricks, each of which probably weighed a chunk of fire brick uh, weighing 50 pounds and, and thousands of them had to come over and be dragged up um, first by ship to Kingston and then up these wretched trails up to Marmara and then installed in the, uh, in the um, blast furnaces. They're all marked leads right on them so we know that's where they came from. A lot of the workers may well have come from there. Um, sometimes there was no encouragement from England to slip these people out and bring them uh, over to the colonies. But this seems to have been an enterprise that had a kind of a tacit approval. So uh, we see in Marmor, we still see people with the same names that you would see doing the same sort of business over in Britain. We see the Leonards and the Hughes and uh, a series of other surnames which are still local to Marmor, which are connected for centuries to other blast furnaces in Britain. And th these people undoubtedly were enticed over here somehow or other. So this was all part of what Hayes had to do and which looks almost incomprehensible. Although he was Upper Canada's leading industrialist, Charles Hayes could not get his way with the masters of the colony. The family compact, as they became to be known, valued the ironworks, but had little need for the individual ironmaster who had built them. If Hayes packed his bags and left for England, he could hardly put his furnaces in them. Government of Upper Canada was, uh, was centralized. The theory was of the British colonial uh, office that they were to follow the instructions of the British colonial office. They had a lieutenant governor who was in charge of an executive council. They did have an elected assembly, but they had very little power. And Bond Head, before the 1837 rebellion, simply disbanded them. When William Lyon Mackenzie was elected to the legislative body, they simply dismissed him. They voted on it to get rid of him. He was a bit of a pest, but you know, he was a great a great Canadian, really. He stood up to the uh, uh, colonial rules. He stood up to the family compact. The family compact were like kids in a candy shop. They had control over who got land, and there were millions of acres. They had uh, effectively either cheated or disposed the native owners or occupants of that land, and they were then handing it out willy-nilly, largely to their friends, to military people. They were, it was in lieu of pension, it was in lieu of debts that they had. It was handed out in, a, in enormous uh, segments to themselves. The members of the Executive Council got so many acres, thousands of acres each. Their family got them. The veterans of the War of 1812 got it. Their family, the Loyalists got it. The late arriving Loyalists got land. They were able to sustain their support because if you got a lot of land to give out, you're gonna have a lot of admirers <laughs> and a lot of people who wanna work with you. People who had immigrated to Upper Canada for a new life who were sick of being governed back in Britain by the hoity-toity and the oligarchy that ran Britain, they'd come out here for a little freedom and they'd start hearing somebody is speaking up and they're smashing his press. There started to be a groundswell of support for uh, William Lyon Mackenzie. And that put him at loggerheads with Bond Head. 
Bondhead being the conservative, William Lyon Mackenzie insisting on uh, uh, on change, and that time Upper Canada grew up and became more democratic, became more realist, and wasn't just handing out land to its own friends. But luckily for Hayes, he was not a political man, not an activist. He was Upper Canada's leading industrialist. They probably had low estimation of its success, as iron manufacturing in 1820 was as it is today. It's subject to the ebb and tide of political forces, over which no iron master could have controlled, no matter how well he made his product. The tides of trade could ruin him. Peace could often be the greatest enemy. The Marmara Ironworks would become the most advanced in Canada. And in the parlance of the time, the village became an iron plantation for the like of the southern plantation. The community was built for a specific commercial purpose. Because of its isolation, all materials, social and religious needs, had to be satisfied from the community. The ironworks was the source of direct pay to its workers. The village stores were virtually the only place to spend that income. The village was alone like an island in a sea made up of endless forest. What had attracted people to the Marmor area? One of the major things was described as an inexhaustible mountain of iron ore, which would be able to sustain the empire indefinitely. That was a bit of an exaggeration. Nevertheless, uh, seven miles from Marmor, at an area now designated as Blairton was a, uh, a mountain of uh, very high quality iron ore, which was uh, what Hayes wanted to exploit and what subsequent uh, owners of the mine did exploit. The mountain of iron ore was again hard rock mining with all that entails, bringing in the workers, uh, using the um, the dynamite later on and earlier using the gunpowder to loosen it, all that sort of effort, and then load it onto barges where it could be taken from Blairton across the river, down by the, uh, across the lake, down through the river to the blast furnaces in Marmor. So that uh, became a separate community. Unfortunately for Charles Hayes, he realized after he got there that when he was surveying his holdings and what he'd been given by the government, it stopped just short of the inexhaustible mountain of iron ore. So he had to go back to the family compact and say, well, you've given me thousands of acres, but it doesn't include what I wanted. So they said, well, we'll give you that. And we'll think about that, but we'll give that to you. But you have to survey for us a couple of townships. So. The man who came as Iron Master had become a um, surveyor in order to get what he had originally wanted. When he asked the family compact, we need a post office here, he became postmaster. They said, oh, you're postmaster. When he asked for a justice of the peace, guess what? They declared that he was the justice of the peace. And uh, he seems to have been basically on his own given these minor appointments <laughs> to keep him quiet. And uh, they did give him the inexhaustible mountain of iron ore, but not without uh, extracting their uh, pound of flesh from him by making him uh, survey some land so that they could give it to their friends and colonists. Nonetheless, got over his defeat continued with his enterprise and uh, over the next four or five years developed a, a community which still exists and an industry which employed 150, 200 men plus all the supply chain that's related to any industry like that, uh, supporting farms and uh, uh, the charcoal reducers, the loaders for the top of the furnace. It was uh, in two Furnaces were 35 feet tall. They were loaded from a cliff at the top by uh, loaders who poured in um, iron ore, uh, charcoal, and limestone as a flux. 
at the base of this chimney, the whole sandwich of material would slowly burn down towards the base where the blast, it's called a blast because there is a blast, and there were um, water wheels driving enormous bellows, 25 foot long each, which just blast the base to keep that fire going because you had to get uh, um, something approaching 3,000 degrees to melt the iron ore. So this was, uh, it was, a, it was quite, a, quite a work crew involved. And when the blast furnace was going, uh, it would be called a campaign. And that campaign would go on for six or nine months, during which they would produce up to, uh, up to a ton of product a day out of each furnace. So this was a hive of activity and uh, one in the middle of nowhere, but it was a hive of activity and he had to sustain all the logistics of that. He built himself a rather uh, uh, a fine log home, which we feel still stands today, but has been bricked over. It stands on the main street of Marmara today. It's been moved from its original location. There was a school, there was a tannery, there was a bark mill, there was a sawmill. All these things were developed well ahead of their time in Upper Canada. This wasn't the first iron ore furnace, but it was the first really successful one. It was also the first what you'd call a company town where everybody was reliant on what was available in that little community because there wasn't much transportation in or out. Because the two furnaces faced each other, their output could be combined in heavy casting operations. When the casting was not underway, the furnace turned out pig iron. This was either shipped as ballast to the naval depot at Kingston, or was used on site to make wrought iron. In this process, the pig was remelted in a smaller finery furnace, somewhat resembling a blacksmith's hearth. The resulting bloom was pounded by a massive water-driven hammer to squeeze out impurities. Reheating in the final chauffeury furnace and further hammering drew the bar out in a pure enough form for sale for further manufacturing operations. All this equipment was driven by some 12 water wheels. The wheels for the main furnace blowing engines were 25 feet or more in diameter and six to seven feet wide. The whole village was a hive of activity. There, from the banks of the Crow River, a great truncated pyramid of limestone rose 30 feet up against the cliff. Hayes's fillers trooped one by one along the gangway to dump their barrels of charcoal, limestone and ore down the chute that led to the chimney. Twilight was always the best time to feel the power of the works. The Crow River drove it all. The great water wheels groaned and pumped the bellows, which forced the blast, which fired the furnace which melted the ore. Flame shot up from the furnace and sparks blew across the village. At the furnace base, the molten iron was drawn out into troughs and men in leathers led the flow into side troughs. From the ridge, the glowing iron looked like a sow feeding its piglets. The, the Upper Canada government wasn't sending the contracts they were supposed to. They had promised when he came to buy so much ballast, and they weren't quite getting around to passing it in the legislature and forwarding it to him. So after four or five years, he was getting to the stage where he must have reflected that my fortune is going into those furnaces just as if I shoveled it down the chimney top. It's disappearing. I'm losing money. And so he was determined to try to correct that situation and he went back for a temporary period. He came back down through Belleville, Kingston, down the St. Lawrence, over to England, unfortunately never to return again. He tried to get financing, he tried to recover it, he tried to uh, reestablish what he called his ultimate dream of uh, going back to Marmara, but when he was back in Britain in 1825. There was a general kind of a depression, one of the first worldwide depressions taking place, and financiers couldn't be talked into lending him more money to throw down the chimneys in Marmara. 
so it simply didn't work for him. He, um, we don't know much what happened to him afterwards. We do know that eventually after petitioning the Upper Canada government, they uh, gave him what they always did when you made a claim against them. They gave him more land. Even though he wasn't coming back, they gave him 8,000 acres, which he could dispose of as he wished. <laughs> it was a common trip, trick of the family compact to buy off the people they either owed money to or ought to have owed money to or were related to by giving them land. Discouraged, Charles Hayes moved to Dublin where from 1839 to his death in 1844, he rebuilt his earlier fortune while dreaming of a return to the Marmara Ironworks. It just wasn't feasible, but it was a great adventure. And I think that's what Hayes saw in it. He gave it a try. And as far as the powers of be in Upper Canada, they were more than happy to encourage him because they knew one thing, even if it was a failure, he couldn't take the blast furnace home with him it was gonna be here for the use of Upper Canada in the future. I have not yet received a shilling from the works. Thus you see, it is not always the person who has done the most service who is most likely to be rewarded. For I cannot help saying that I think I have done more good to Upper Canada than any other individual that ever was in it. Charles Hayes. There's another hundred tons of ore But that big chimney standing dark and cold Although his iron heart was willing Hayes could never make a shilling The molten metal was no pot of gold And the iron master cried Boys, I tried and I tried But this cursed country's beating me down I'll never make Marmara an iron town. Well, the iron master said, Get those fillers to the tunnel head, Have the gutter man ready for the last time tonight. Get that water wheel turning, Blast those bellows till the fire burning in the furnace. In 1819, Peter McGill became a founding director of Canada's first bank, the Bank of Montreal. He would later be its long-term president. McGill made some extraordinarily wise investments and one extraordinarily bad one in the Marmara Ironworks. Surely, thought McGill, a chance to invest in them was an opportunity too good to ignore. McGill seems to have been involved in the ironworks from the very start. At first, as a financer for Charles Hayes, and later, as the owner by default, McGill would find that there was no money to be made at Marmara. Although he would fail here, he seems to have been successful everywhere else. Peter McGill was a remarkable man. He had uh, been born uh, a McCutcheon. Uh, his surname was McCutcheon. And he had the fortune of having a rather rich uncle by the surname of McGill, who didn't have any heirs. And on the condition he changed his surname, became uh, Peter McGill. And he was a, uh, a very successful um, banker, financier in Montreal, what they call the square mile, where all the planning for expenditures in Canada really went through, and Peter McGill uh, as a Scotsman, uh, was um, involved in every social part of Montreal, every, um, every financial part of Montreal, and almost all the enterprises. Somehow his ear was bent on behalf of Charles Hayes and he made that investment in the Marmor site. He, he took it over as one of the trustees once uh, Charles Hayes left and tried to run it again. The one thing about um, Marmara is 
Once it was established, you can only say that hope sprung eternal, that it would be restarted, that somehow somebody could make this magnificent installation work again. And there were a number of schemes to do so. McGill was at the peak of Canada's business, social and political power. But from Marmara, he never could extract any profit. The mineral supply was wonderful. Hayes's blast furnaces were marvelous. His village established. But it was all in the middle of nowhere. You just could not make money dragging ton after ton of iron, 35 miles down hopeless roads to Belleville. Miguel enlisted Anthony Manahan. Anthony Manahan came in 1820, same year that Charles Hayes came to uh, Canada. Anthony Manahan ended up as uh, um, a Hayes's agent in Kingston. And um, Peter McGill, when he became effectively the owner of the Marmor site, asked Manahan to take charge. Became quite a merchant in Kingston. And when he was asked by Peter McGill to take over the uh, Marmor site, he was willing to do so, and he did so. And he came up to Marmor, uh, spent a lot of his own energy, and he claims his own money, although he was pretty tight with his money. He seems to have done pretty well with his money compared to Hayes. And he built one of the, uh, one of the what is our proudest site in Marmor, which is the St. Matilda's Church, which was started in 1825 to 1827, somewhere in that region. Now this was a Catholic church, a Catholic church in an Anglican colony. And it was not a, a, a great uh, appeal to the uh, family compact that this be done. It was one of the first Catholic churches that wasn't on the waterfront. Because remember all the immigrants were basically coming Montreal to Kingston to Prescott to Brockville to Belleville to Coburg and all those stations. When you start going north, there was less of a presence. But Hayes's workers were largely Catholic. And when Manahan went up there, Manahan was Catholic. So he established this church called St. Matilda's, which was one of the first ones, Catholic churches, which was not on the waterfront, if you like, of Lake Ontario and the, and the tributaries. In a way, the ironworks fell into his hands too early, as Canada's self-professed first railway tycoon. But in 1825, it would be a whole decade before a railway ran in Canada. And by the time the trains were running, Peter McGill was more interested in selling than running the ironworks. His early enthusiasm was slowly stripped by the furnaces, which, no matter how well they were managed, seemed determined to cost their owner money. The uh, furnaces seem to have been blast, in blast uh, through the 1820s. There was in, uh, a report from a colonel who visited who was saying that they were still employing about 150 people there in 1828. Shortly after that, it seems to have closed down with a view to being reopened if only they could get everything together and get it organized again to get somebody to invest money and the workers back at the site, they thought it would reopen. Now all this time, Manahan was associated with the management of it. And in 1837, he came up with another one of his plans, schemes to get it open. And that was to move the Kingston Penitentiary to Marmar. So in 1837, it was a time before conflict of interest was considered to be inappropriate it was pretty much appropriate if you were involved in something financially to get involved politically too. So Manahan took that opportunity to get himself appointed as one of three commissioners to study the possibility of moving the Kingston Penitentiary from a waterfront in Kingston and up to Marmara. And why not, he argued. We have a bunch of people who are working for nothing anyway for us down in the penitentiary. We might as well give them some real work up in Marmara and have them work the blast furnace, have them uh, be in an area where it was harder for them to escape because they were surrounded by a wilderness and having them um, produce something of benefit to uh, Upper Canada, which 
still did, it had some ironworks around, but it still didn't have anything as grand as the old Marmara site going. And he said, if we can just move them up there, then uh, not only will I make some money, but so will the colony. And uh, he was uh, two out of three of the commissioners voted yes, let's move it. But it wasn't something the government was going to really do. There was too much power in the Kingston area to do that. And they posed some of the problems. They said, well, a lot of these people we have here are disciplined. They're in rough shape, you know. They're just not uh, able to do the heavy work of uh, what's required for a blast furnace. Not only that, they're supposed to be penitent. They're supposed to be quiet. They're serving their sentence basically in quiet. Even the chapel in Kingston, uh, when you went to chapel, there were wooden bars between you and the next guy, so you couldn't see him. You weren't allowed to communicate with him. You were supposed to be penitent. And how can they run a blast furnace if they don't talk to each other? So it was a scheme that just didn't work. During the McGill period, attempts were made to continue the industry. Iron ballast and cast iron were produced during the years immediately following Hayes' departure. However, this attempt to maintain the industry also failed. The ironworks was sold at a loss. Throughout the 1830s, the furnaces lay silent after another failed attempt by Thomas Hetherington, who proposed moving the furnaces to the Bay of Quinty and only shipping the mined ore. And there was a rebellion. In 1837, after years of brutal repression, Louis Joseph Papineau, Robert Nelson and others, called the Patriots, rebelled against British power in Lower Canada. As the British emptied their garrisons to reinforce troops in Lower Canada, William Lyon Mackenzie attempted to exploit the opportunity with his own rebellion in Upper Canada. In 1838, the British Parliament quickly replaced the Lower Canada Legislature with the Special Council, which was appointed by the Governor and which Peter McGill played no small part. A key shared goal was responsible government, which was eventually achieved in the incident's aftermath. There was another successful, perhaps in the longer term more successful, uh, iron uh, master than Charles Hayes, and that was Van Norman. Uh, now uh, the memory of Van Norman lives in uh, Tilsonburg, and named after a partner of his, and Normandale, named after him, where there were quite successful uh, iron blast furnace. And naturally Van Norman would be attractive to the opportunities that Marmor offered. It was yet another attempt to get Marmor going. And, and there was a string of attempts to try to get Marmara back up and operating. Nobody could believe that this site which had been developed and built could not be used productively. And as the time went by and they realized that maybe the railroad would be the thing that would solve the transportation issue. Because before that it was all about transportation. You could make these products, you could make a iron cauldron. You could make, as, as Hayes did, two cannon that he declared were fit to defend the empire. You could make these things, but you couldn't move them if you had a road covered in ruts and, and a spring mud and uh, no real way to transport them. Hayes wanted a canal to join the Trent, but nobody would do that. It, but all of a sudden, um, as the 1800s went on, we were looking at the new technology of a railroad. And people were saying, well, if we could just get a railroad up to Marmor, then maybe we can get the furnaces blasting, maybe we can use the iron ore, and maybe we can, uh, in a sensible financial way, get it out and to the markets. Yeah, it seems to be uh, a common thread in Marmor. If you invest your fortune, you're not likely to get most of it out. Following the purchase of the site by American Joseph Van Norman in 1847, the village had a new iron master. He had a feel for the industry and had already developed the technical ability second to none. Marmra was no longer unique as an iron town or a company town. The iron business no longer dominated village life. 
Lacking a sufficient return due to unaffordable transportation costs, Van Norman was forced to sell the enterprise in 1854 at a substantial loss. When the Marma Foundry Company took over the industry, they also placed a substantial investment into the ironworks. It was anticipated at the time that the industry could become successful if sufficient capital could be raised and if transportation to market was done by rail. Unfortunately, sufficient technical expertise was not at hand, and the first attempts at producing iron either ended in failure or in substantial reduced production. Transportation by rail was never realized, and the industry again collapsed. The Marmara Iron Company, however, continued to exist, although production at the site ceased in the 1850s. In December 1866, the company amalgamated with the Coburg and Peterborough Railway Company and thus received a substantial economic boost. However, the advent of more efficient technologies elsewhere at this time made charcoal iron less competitive throughout Canada, and no efforts were made to revive the Marmara Ironworks. It was as much Blairton as Marmara that captured the imagination of the first explorers in the township. In back of Rawdon, unlike Marmara, Blairton was a mountain of iron-rich ore like no other they had seen. The settlement at Blairton had grown into a bustling little community. Named after a Scottish settler, it boasted a railway station, telegraph office, three general stores, two hotels, and sundry blacksmith shops. No fewer than 11 streets had been laid and the population had increased rapidly to a total of 500. At its peak, the mine became the largest producer of iron in Ontario. The ore from the mine at Blairton was extracted for sale to companies in the United States. The most productive years of this arrangement were from 1868 to 1873 and by 1882, a total of over 250,000 tons of ore had been exported. A track was built from Blairton on Crow Lake near the mine, down to the Trent River Bridge. There, on another elevated spur of the track, cars bringing the ore from the mine could be emptied into the scows, which pulled up underneath the tracks. The scows were then towed upstream to Harwood, where a steam conveyor belt loaded the ore into the Coburg-bound trains. These cars were all built by the Crossan Works in Coburg. Remnants of these early rail cars have miraculously survived because of an operational mishap in 1881. At the railway's loading pier at the Trent Rivers Narrows, the accident left five cars submerged and preserved in the river for 99 years. By the end of the decade, however, the ore had begun to ran out. Cheaper American ore made it pointless to search for more in the area. The last ore shipments were made in 1878. The mine shut down in 79 and the company cleared out in 1881. If hope springs eternal anywhere, it does so in Marmara. The ironworks had cost Hayes and Van Norman their fortunes, and McGill a good part of his. The Marmara story, better described as a story of lack of timing. The entrepreneurs tried and invested, but somehow the times were never just right. Hayes's works were a dream for a future with which the province seemed to never quite catch up. Following the closure of the Blairton iron mine, Thomas Pierce obtained the property of the Coburg, Peterborough, and Marmara Railway and Mining Company, including thousands of acres of timber limits. A sawmill enterprise was constructed at the site of the Marmara Ironworks, and the abandoned buildings of the earlier industry were probably torn down. The greatest business in town was the Pierce Company and its mills. A virtual dynasty had been established by Reeve and Warden, Thomas Peter Pierce. He was nothing if not a consummate businessman. The Pierces built mills at Marmara in 1873, and their resourcefulness would lead them successfully into all sorts of associated businesses for over a half a century. Yeah, the, the Pierce family were um, originally from Norwood, and they spread out. 
as these families did, and they spread into Marmara where they got positions, uh, some of them were JPs, Justice of the Peace, and so on. And they ran for local government. And again, it was a time where conflict of interest really wasn't much of a concern. Thomas Pierce became warden eventually, and uh, he also um, negotiated with uh, the successors to the Hayes Ironworks and Blast Furnace. At that time, there were 42,000 acres up for sale, and uh, he managed to uh, uh, acquire it all for a very small consideration. Uh, the uh, package included these thousands of acres that had been used to fuel the blast furnaces. It included the, uh, the site and, and Blairton. It included the works. It included a lot of the produced pig iron, which was lying about in the Marmor site. And um, it um, was with a view to perhaps, in everybody's opinion, starting up the blast furnace again and tying it by railroad to Coburg. A very, uh, very cagey man, but eventually made the plunge and, and took over the, the site. His major interest became the lumber business. And for uh, a few decades, he ran a successful lumber business. But like everything else, you know, the time changes. You either run out of timber or the markets change. And uh, as with Hayes, eventually his enterprise was uh, liquidated and I sold at a, uh, basically a bankruptcy fire sale price uh, to the Armstrong family who continued it for a while. And... The Pierce Enterprise itself was located on the top of the ruins of Charles Hayes' 1821 ironworks. A lot of the stonework had been pirated for limestone building blocks so that the mills were driven by the river's power for a new purpose. But by the early 1920s, Ravaged by successive fires, the enterprise would be obliterated, and only proof that they were even there was the stone foundations we see today. On November 30th, 1933, a sad sale of lands was conducted by the county. When the results were tallied, a vast tract of wild lands of the Lake Township had been lost by the Pierce Company to tax arrears, and it had been lost for a pittance. More than 8,000 acres were sold that day, the total proceeds were $1,587.32, a paltry 19 cents an acre. Four years before the defeat of Germany in World War II, the Canadian government joined with the American-based Bethlehem Steel Corporation to finally take an interest in the mineral riches of the Marmara region in Hastings County. Bethlehem Steel purchased 1,900 acres in the Marmara area. When I came to Marmara in 1973, uh, there were still something in the range of 250 people working at the site of Bethlehem Steel. Bethlehem Steel was an enormous iron deposit that was found by aeromagnetism. They were flying over in the 50s, the Marmara area, were literally hanging from the plane, a magnetic uh, detector that would respond to iron ore deposits. The iron ore deposit it responded to was covered in over 100 feet of limestone. So it was way down, and it had to be opened up to, uh, to be exploited. Bethlehem Steel, an American company from Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, uh, decided that this was worth doing. So they came up uh, to Marmara. They had, at the peak, probably employed five, 600 people. They had to work for years on removing the overburden. That's the 100 plus feet of limestone over an area of 75 acres and piling it up beside what was becoming their pit and digging down into the iron ore to a final depth of over 700 feet, and then having the uh, road constructed spiraling down there to the bottom to pick up the iron ore, driving these enormous trucks back up to the top 
where they had plants to pelletize it, to refine it to a certain extent, break it up and pelletize it, and load it by train to go down um, to uh, Lake Ontario at Picton, and then transfer it over to Rochester and down to uh, Bethlehem, uh, Pennsylvania. The mighty Marmerton Mine. Folks flocked to the town. And almost overnight, it seemed, the hotel was bulging with prospectors, geologists, company men, government representatives, and fellows just looking for work. Old timers shook their heads and muttered their disbelief. They couldn't believe it was all happening again. Time passed swiftly. Good profits were made and men enjoyed steady work. In the late 1970s, the pace slowed to a tiny trickle. The cause was a combination of a sluggish economy, runaway inflation, and a precipitous slide in world demand for steel. Altogether, the mine remained operational for a period of 27 years, a long time when judged by past performances. In March of 1978, closure was finalized, taking with it untold jobs both in the mine and on the Picton loading dock. More than half the carrier ships were removed from service immediately. 300 jobs and a $2 million payroll disappeared and 22 years of provincial grants also came to an abrupt halt. The memory of her founders lives on in Marmara only in the street names. The foundry site has been repurposed any evidence of the foundry is mostly gone. Above the works on the ledge where the coal houses and kilns sat is now empty. The twin enemies of heritage, progress and fire, have taken their toll. The Iron Master's house still remains on Forsyth Street, the big house, clad in red brick, majestic in the heart of the village, still hides the first log home built by Charles Hayes, buried inside. There is a sadness in the losses, but even now we can stand on the limestone ledge overlooking the Crow River and think of the challenges that made a village. The Crow spreads out beautifully before you as it flows endlessly and tirelessly past the village. To the north across the lake sits the inexhaustible mountain of ore at Blairton. Here, the loaded ore barges were pushed and towed to the end of their journey. A place of dreams. A place of toil where anything was possible. And a view that turned the pioneer's thoughts to the sublime. said get those fillers to the tunnel head have the gutter man ready in the casting house tonight get that water wheel turning blast those bellows till the fire burning in the furnace is a blinding white well iron master hey swears that one of these days he's gonna melt that mountain down He's gonna make Marmara an iron town It's a twisted rutted hell, a sea of mud from here to Belleville along that trail some jokers call a road And it's far too far to haul those iron bars when an ox cart is the only
another hundred tons of ore But that big chimney stand in dark and cold Although his iron heart was willing Hayes could never make a shilling The molten metal was no pot of gold And the iron master cried Boys, I tried and I tried But this cursed country's beating me I'll never make Marmara an iron town. Well, the iron master said, Get those fellas to the tunnel ahead. Have the gutter man ready for the last time tonight. Get that water wheel turning. Blast those bellows till the fire burning. 